This is Gnostic Media Research and Publishing's podcast, episode number 186. This is another Gnostic Media epic episode, and this episode is an interview with Dave McGowan titled The CIA and the Magic of Laurel Canyon, and is being released on Sunday, December 1st, 2013. This interview with Dave was recorded today. And this interview has been delayed and rescheduled a number of times since March, and I thought David disappeared for a while. But he was back after the Supalakis interview, and today we finally got this done. Dave McGowan was born and raised in the suburbs of Los Angeles, California, where he still resides. After graduating from UCLA in 1983, With an unused degree in psychology, he went to work in construction and now works as a general contractor. He is the proud father of three daughters and is a lifelong music fan. Donations. This episode was brought to you by the generosity of Louis, Carlos, Peter, Janice, Tino, Jeremy, Matthew, Stephen, Marco, and Douglas, Richard, Samuel, Deb, Alan, Max, Joseph, and Paul. And while we do our best to provide just about everything here for free, your donations and website purchases are essential and what keeps Gnostic Media going. And I ask that you please sign up for a membership or make a donation because we just can't do it without you. And we also accept Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Primecoin donations. And please also check out the store page on the website where you have time to order for the holidays and you can get the Wheat Blows bumper stickers, bookmarks with the logical fallacies on the back, our books, the Gnostic Media Archives for the first five years. Those are now up and uh, about two months before normal. And the She Remembers Archives, the Pharmacratic Inquisition DVD, a t-shirt, or a membership to the website to download the older shows. The views expressed by the authors and guests of this unprogram are their own and are not necessarily those held by myself, the host, or Gnostic Media. Check out the website at www.gnosticmedia.com. That's G-N-O-S-T-I-C media.com. You can reach me directly through the contact form on the website or at contact at gnosticmedia.com. Thanks for listening and thank you for your support. Here is my interview with Dave McGowan. The CIA and the magic of Laurel Canyon. I know this has been a long time coming. Enjoy. All right, Dave McGowan, welcome to the Gnostic Media yeah. Podcast. <laughs> How are you doing, sir? I am. Uh, I'm good. I'm completely mentally and physically exhausted, but uh, but other otherwise doing really well, actually. I mean, I, I I can't really complain. You know, I mean, I, I can, but uh, you know, in this economy, complaining about having too much work is uh, you know, <laughs> it's not really something that we should be complaining about, I suppose. So sure. it's just kind of been a, a perfect storm of I, I just got just ridiculously busy in the last couple of months at my real world job. At the very same time that uh, I'm trying to sort of finalize uh, the manuscript for my book, and my publisher keeps sending back new stuff for me to work on that I don't have time for, and it's just it's just been insane. And uh, but uh, you know it's, it's it's all good, I guess. I can use the money, so uh, I can't really complain, I suppose. Well, you know, you and I were supposed to have an interview uh, last March. We had one scheduled, and it never happened, so I'm glad to make it happen today. And uh, since then, myself and Joe Atwill put out a new article that uh, cites you and parallels your research called Manufacturing the Deadhead, a Product of Social Engineering, and that caused... uh, a bit of a stir itself and so it's you know it's been really important to us uh, your work and and so you know of course having an interview with you about all of this stuff and uh, looking at it from both of our angles and seeing what fits I think will be good for everyone here hey one of the uh one of the guys, you can correct me here if I'm wrong, but uh, one of the guys in the Grateful Dead is currently a member of the uh, Bohemian Grove. Is that is that true? I, I think it's uh, three of them. Bob Weir, Mickey Hart, and one other, possibly. 
So yes, oh, really? as many as yeah, and, and 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 Bob Weir, I, I've found videos of Bob Weir actually uh, bragging about it. You know, he's pretty. He thinks it's all pretty cool. You know, they all you know run with uh, the CIA groups. But of course, Bohemian Grove from the Bohemian Club in San Francisco that is actually the sister club of the Century Club in New York, the the famous art club, quote unquote, and then that was run by. Alan Dulles and uh, Alan Dulles and uh, Aldous Huxley and Gordon Wasson were also there. And, of course, Gordon Wasson is the so-called discoverer of magic mushrooms, and uh, which he stole from somebody else's research, uh, John G. Bork from 1891. But all of these guys centered around either uh, the Century Club or the Bohemian Club, etc. So we found a lot of this overlap, and we do know for sure that uh, the Bohemian Club grew directly out of the Century Club. Well, I, I just I did an interview with this other guy. Um, I don't know, quite a while back, and uh, he kept met, he was apparently a big deadhead, big uh, deadhead from back in the day, the very big Grateful Dead fan, and he kept referencing them in the interview. And at one point, said something to the effect of, "Well, I'm I'm just glad that my band, you know, wasn't part of that whole Laurel Canyon scene and and don't have that team." <laughs> <laughs> I, I said, you know, I, I, I hate to break your heart, Bob, but I'm pretty sure that Bob Weir is a member of the boat. And he was just, like, stunned, just, uh, like, just, I just seemed to, like, just completely burst his little bubble and uh, sure. almost felt bad for having told him that, <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> Facts are pesky things, you know, and, uh, yeah, I mean, the Grateful Dead, I mean, they're, uh, you know, the association with Owsley, and you know, I mean, there's there, 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 there a lot of uh, weirdness surrounding them. Sure. I mean, at one point they went, at one point they moved down to Watts, you know, uh, with Owsley, and uh, and basically were running uh, LSD trials out of some decrepit home in Watts that was right alongside a Bordello, you know, which like exactly parallels what the CIA itself was doing at the time in San Francisco and elsewhere was sort of using, you know, you know these bordellos to run acid tests and stuff. And, and, you know, here we have the Grateful Dead going down to Watts, of all places, doing the exact same thing not not long, just months before uh, Watts went up in flames, you know? So, uh, yeah, the Grateful Dead, uh, they, they have some very... Uh, very tantalizing connections, to say the least. But, uh, yeah, he was under the impression that they were sort of, you know, above all of that. But, uh, did, you, did you read our uh, Manufacturing the Deadhead article that uh, exposed uh, their connections and how that was all manufactured? Uh, the whole look, dance, everything. Well, you know, and you heard, I know you did hear my interview with uh, Supalakis uh, recently. Yeah, Wasn't... I did. Yeah, I, I. That was God. That was uh, that was bizarre. You know, I thought I might actually <laughs> be able to pick up a, a few little last minute facts to, to tack onto my book, but uh, nothing she said had any credibility whatsoever. I mean, just uh, it was just mind boggling. Do you, do you the, think that the, the she that... was? Do you think that she was clueless, or do you think she's more of like a matriarch? Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know. It was hard to tell, you know. I mean, without meeting her face to face, uh, it's it hard to get a gauge on on what her agenda was. You know, I, I have, I'm, I'm surprised she even went on the air, kind of, you know. But uh, she was very evasive, you know. Whether it was deliberate or just, uh, you know, her brain just isn't functioning at sure. uh, well, and all she... cylinders nowadays. You know, I, I have, <laughs> she claims that she never did. She claims that they never did any drugs, you know, that these people were, like, drug-free. You know, these people that were known as the acid-drenched, uh, you know, freaks of the movement. Well, but if, were if they were agents, heat. if they were agents, wouldn't it fit that, you know, if they're selling this whole thing to the rest of society, that they would stay clean? You know, it's like... Uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. And Vito supposedly did, you know, just like... Just like uh, Frank Zappa, you know, and even Charles Manson, you know, uh, limited his own intake while drugging it. You know, that, that was kind of a, 
that was part of the course. You know, you know, you know, you had these kind of these, these guru type figures that had all of the little followers around them that they kept drugged while they themselves kind of, you know, maintained control over the situation, so to speak. So, uh, you know, yeah, it's quite possible, that, you know, but, but, uh, but uh, if Sue wasn't doing drugs back in the day, then I don't know what the hell's going on with her brain functioning nowadays because she is really out there, man. I mean, yeah, that was a bizarre interview, to say and, the least. Well, and she had contradicted herself quite a number of times, and there were even more of them than in the uh, final interview that I released. But um, there were, she had a number of contradictions from our, our conversation the day before and then the official recording. And I was, you know, I would bring up stuff that she admitted and she would sit there totally denying that she had said anything about it, you know, and it's really interesting how, uh, you know, people uh, who weren't p part of the two or three conversations I had with her, you know, they're like, you know, a lot of them are trying to defend her. No, she's just old and, you know, she's really innocent. But there were so many d just direct contradictions. And a couple of times she was trying to call me a liar for something that she said, you know, and if she knew that all of the agent, you know, the the funny thing is she's telling me that she knows that their art store is a central hub. They know that FBI and other agents are in their uh, their art classes and stuff. And then she claims that well, you know, they had to move north to get away from that. Is that what she says? Some of her comments were just so bizarre, you know. I mean, like, it's very well known that, that their place was a crash pad and that people stayed over there regularly, a lot of under And that the bands themselves, you know, the birds hung out there then rehearsed there. Arthur Lee and Love uh, are on record as having lived there and, and rehearsed there. And yet she's claimed that nobody ever... The people would come and visit for the day, but they'd never stay over at night. What she said something about well, Vito took a nap every afternoon, and everybody knew that they had to and, leave. And, <laughs> right, and, and he locked the he locked the door. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what is she talking? But you know, the funny part was that you know uh, they would come back late at night and then party all night, but they didn't crash there. Yeah, you know, so you got yeah, a bunch right. of people the nap, drunk. Yeah, then they would come, but then they would come back. Right, a bunch of people drunk and ever, drugged out was, coming was, back. Yeah, I mean, and some of the things she said were just downright factually incorrect. At one point, she said something about, oh, yeah, there were people living at Tom Mix's old place, which was the log cabin, and across the street at Harry Houdini's old house, which burned down in 1959, had been in ruins for years by the time, you know, and yet she's claiming the people were living there, you know, so I mean, some, some of this stuff that she said was just absolutely factually incorrect, and, and, and you know, there's just, there's no question about it. The, some of the years that she got, she was like way off on when she claimed that different things happened, and I, yeah, it was just, it was just bizarre. I mean, I didn't really get anything too useful out of that, and uh, she actually even claimed not to know some aspects of Vito's history. You know, I mean, she didn't she claim that she didn't know that he had a Rockefeller connection or something? Yes, she did. She that she that his uh, his cousin was uh, married to uh, Rockefeller. Yeah, she claimed to have no knowledge of that whatsoever. That you know, I mean, how could she not know that? You know, some of the stuff was just uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, it's hard to say. Uh, some of it was probably deliberately evasive, and some of it was just uh, yeah. His I, I his, don't know. his cousin, lunch, uh, maybe. I don't. from what I can tell, his cousin Eva Paul was married to Winthrop Rockefeller. That was confirmed for me by a member of the family who asked not to be identified because he said he's already gotten a lot of flack from other family members for spilling uh, deep, dark family secrets. And, and well, we didn't even get that from him. We didn't even get that from you. We had found it from our own source. So, you know, that you had oh, confirmed you? that. That's, that's two of us looking at it from different angles going, those people are related, you know. And actually it was my co-author, Joe Atwell, that had found that one. Yeah, which she claimed to have no knowledge of, you know, and I several other things that, yeah, that was... Uh, that was a strange one, man. I mean, I was very excited when I saw that heard that you had interviewed her, and I, I you know, I thought maybe I'd get a little inside, uh, 
you know, a little insider information that I hadn't heard before, but virtually nothing she said. I mean, I, I know from other people that I've talked to and other research that I've done that a lot of what she said just simply wasn't true. So, uh, and that's, yeah, you know, <laughs> and that's the, you know, the interesting thing <laughs> is that photograph of her that we used for that episode. It's like her standing there in the front and all of these people around her, like she is, you know, some sort of uh, matriarch. And which would certainly, yeah. it would certainly explain her blatant line during the interview, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. And then, uh, yeah, she also, at some point in the interview, she said that something about, uh, we, when she said that they went up north to start a family or something like that, completely ignoring the fact that she had actually already started a family down here. And then the kid had mysteriously died at the age of two, which she completely left out of the narrative of that whole, you know. It was just, yeah, it was a, some of the things she said would just stunned me. I'm and just like, and wasn't the, just, wasn't that uh, kid, didn't he disappear surrounding Anton LaVey and uh, some, some, what was that film called, Hollywood or something like that? Mondo Hollywood, yeah, he had actually been, been, been uh, according to, I think it was the San Francisco Chronicle reported, that he had actually been handpicked by Kenneth Anger, disciple of Anton LaVey and uh, whatnot, to, um, to play Lucifer in his film Lucifer Rising. He was the one that was originally going to be cast to play Lucifer. He was going to be the infant Lucifer. And then he died, you know, in this uh, accident. And so obviously Kenneth Anger and probably LeVay had some, you know, connection, level of connection to uh, Vito and Sue, obviously, or how would have he, he have ever even hooked up with this idea of using the kid, you know? So, um, so the, uh, but, uh, yeah, so then, and then, uh, you know, after the kid, uh, after the kid died in this mysterious accident, of course, he ends up casting, of all people, Bobby Bozole <laughs> of the Manson family. So, yeah, there's, I mean, there's all these weird interconnections between, you know, the Church of Satan and the Manson family and the Vito squad and, uh, just a whole little sordid, uh, you know, backdrop to all of this. <laughs> Which she conveniently <laughs> left out of her uh, of her version of events entirely. Never even mentioned her her first firstborn son. Her only you know their their only kid at the time. Her firstborn and only son died at the age of two, like like the day before Christmas. You know, it was like on December twenty third, I think, like two days before Christmas. You know, didn't you? Did, you got all the you, was did you find out that she had gone dancing or something like that right after it happened? Yeah, yeah. The kid died according to according to his death certificate. He was pronounced dead at like seven p.m. and like uh, immediately afterward, Vito and Sue and the rest of their crew went out dancing at the clubs as if it was just another night. Yeah, their their two year old son dies on two days shy of Christmas. And they're out, they're out dancing in the clubs uh, literally within, like, minutes. You know, it was just so bizarre. And uh, so, of course, yeah, she, she probably didn't really much want to discuss that particular chapter of her life because that's a little hard to explain, isn't it? I mean, I just, yeah, you know, mind-boggling to me. I thought of asking her point blank. I, you know, maybe I should have waited till the last question of the interview in an hour and a half in or whatever and drop that one and, and see how she would have uh, responded, you know, but uh, I didn't want to have a, a 15 minute interview with her. I was hopefully trying to get something. I mean, there were a few little bits that we were able to get out of it, but, uh, you know, it was astounding to me that, you know, it, here's there's nothing going on. And, and, you know, her statement that she had to go out and dance for Jim Morrison and all of this stuff. You know, it's like they're on the clock. They have to go out and dance. They have to go promote the horse crap. You know, well, they were a major. You know, as, as I point out in the book, they were a major part of of creating that whole scene and of building that whole buzz. You know, I mean, sure. they're, they're long forgotten now. They're definitely, you know, I mean, I've never heard of the guy. I have never heard of the name Vito Palika, so nobody I know has ever heard of it. And it's 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 very hard to dig up much information on the guy. It's all little bits and pieces, a few sentences in this book, a few, you know. And 
as I was going through all these books, you know, doing the research, the first three or four times I came across the name, I just passed right over it. I'm like, I never heard of this guy. He's barely mentioned here. He's just, you know, mentioned in passing, can't be important. And it was only after the name kept coming up over and over again, just in these offhand references, that I realized there's got to be something to this guy because he just seems to pop up everywhere. And uh, so I went digging, and it's very hard to find much information on him. I mean, he's, he's their, you know, he and his wife and their crew and his sidekick Carl Franzoni and the rest of the crew, they are all but forgotten now, but they were a major, major part of launching the scene. More, more important than in the band, you know, I have quotes from, from people like, you know, Gail Frappa admitting that, you know, the origin, what originally drew people out to the clubs wasn't the bands and the music, it was the spectacle on the dance floor, you know, that this is a whole new brand of music that just, sure. just, just kind of grew, emerged overnight, you know, the folk rock, the, Chloe, shh, be quiet, my dog, well, you know, know. <laughs> and you know, all, oh, just, I, I just wanted to throw, I just wanted to throw in, in real quick, you know, when I would mention the deadhead look and dance to her, you know, uh, she kept saying she had no idea what that was. And meanwhile, she's the one who started thrift store, uh, you know, going to thrift, you know, to design these uh, types of clothes and stuff like that. And she had a store mm-hmm. on uh, Sunset or whatever that Vito create, uh, that Vito opened for her and designed for her so that it would attract it would attract uh miss you know people that were misled to her right or something to that effect she says during this interview which was just a really weird comment yeah yeah absolutely yes yeah, she did yeah her the uh, the Vito Clay studio uh you know where the which was not only the rehearsal the initial rehearsal space for some of these bands but is also where, yeah, his wife opened the first, what is considered to be the first sort of hippie clothing boutique, you know, and uh, introduced that whole look. So, I mean, yeah, they were hugely influential, hugely. I mean, the, the scene would have, probably would, have, would have never got to where it was, you know, without them, because, you know, as people have admitted, these clubs were brand new, you know. They just started popping up like mushrooms in the 1960s, you know, just as, as if all these these uh, speculators knew that there was going to be this big music scene happening, you know, and these bands just all started popping up out of nowhere, but nobody had ever heard of these clubs and nobody had ever heard of these bands and nobody had ever heard this style of music. And what really set the, set the ball rolling and got people out there was all the publicity that these freaks were getting and this huge spectacle that they were putting on on the dance floor, which also, by the way, uh, served to mask the fact that the bands, a lot of the bands weren't all that good, you know, and if people were focused on the spectacle on the dance floor, they weren't paying attention to how bad the musicians were, you know, so they were hugely influential, sure. hugely in, in launching the scene and fashioning the work, the, the styles, the fashions, the hairstyles, the clothing styles. All of that. I mean, just hugely influential, and they are like almost completely forgotten now in all of the uh, sure. all of the books that have been written on on the era. You know, they just receive a, just a passing mention here and there. Well, in my interview with her, she even denied that they were called the Freaks. Did she? <laughs> okay. <laughs> On Zappa's album covers, they were called that. And, you know, the song Hungry Freak's Daddy uh, on the original Freak Out album was dedicated to Carl Franzoni, you know, Vito's uh, full-time sidekick. You know, I mean, everybody knew they were called. They, they, <laughs> yeah, so, I yeah, don't know. She, I don't she know did, what to say about that She didn't know what the deadhead look and dance was that she created. <laughs> she didn't know who the freaks were that she was one of the leaders of. Um, you know, I mean, she she's sitting there tells me telling me that Vito told her everything, but then uh, he never told her how he won the uh, Groucho Marx Award, and he, you know, which is kind of funny. And uh, he gets uh, you know the equivalent of like fifty thousand or a hundred thousand dollars or whatever to go get this uh, this art uh, degree in 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 rome and uh you know but she's she's totally clueless or totally lying about every detail in the interview 
You know, and it's just so funny because when you go through and you understand how, you know, like as we wrote in Manufacturing the Deadhead, when you understand how Edward Bernays' role played into this, he promoted Voslav Nijinsky, this uh, this uh, effeminate uh, uh, dancer on stage in the early 1910s and 20s that mimed masturbation. This was one of Edward Bernays', the, you know, the father of propaganda. This was one of his first uh, gigs. And so, you know, Sue admits in my interview with her that she was one of the Voslav Nijinsky dancers. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I mean, you couldn't, you know, just a direct tie in there. And she admits it, but she can't, you know, she denies being a part of any of it, denies knowing that any of it was going on, denies being called the freaks, deny, 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 deny. She seems, she seems to deny that there even was a freak group at all. I, I thought at some point you asked her if she could, you know, kind of talk about or name some of the other members of the group, and, and, and she was like, what, there was a group? Well, we didn't have a, you know, it was, like, what, it was just me and Vito, you know? Sure. <laughs> As I seem like she was trying to say, you know, I'm like, what is she talking about? <laughs> of course they have. Yeah, it's just, I mean, she didn't, she couldn't even come up with the name Carl Frank. I never even heard her mention him. And he was a constant, I mean, he was photographed with Vito and her constantly. He was in movies with him. I mean, he was always around and she couldn't even seem to remember that he was part of the group, you know? It's just. Yeah, it was, uh, uh, I don't know, something, something seriously wrong with that gal. <laughs> so, either, that yeah, or she's, either that or she's on the payroll still selling the, the BS, and she thought that she could, you know, it's possible that she thought that we would buy her crap and not uh, get together and do another show, you know, shortly after exposing all of the uh, lies that she told during that show. You know, Dave, let me ask you, though. What's, what, her, what's her family background? I couldn't find much of anything on her. I'd be curious to know what her family uh, was. She, uh, she admitted that her dad was a uh, stealth bomber designer or something like, or not or, uh, uh, not stealth bomber, uh, you know, like, a, oh, shoot, uh, you know, like the SR-71 type of plane designer. Uh, which of course fits the whole thing, but she's like, you know, and you know, my dad was Intel. We never thought anything about it, you know. That's shocking. That's <laughs> who would have guessed, you know? It's, who uh, guessed? Wow. Yeah. You know, and, and another thing is that she started working with uh, Vito down at the art store. She says she was interested in art and all this stuff, but she was sixteen, so I guess that really makes Vito a pedophile. Yeah, it's another thing she didn't mention that. Yeah, when she met, she he was she was sixteen. He was like fifty, I think. And when when they got married, she he waited till she was eighteen to marry her, and he was forty eight at the right. time, thirty years her senior. Which uh, yeah, she also kind of neglected the. Yeah, I mean, she still seems to uh, be very protective towards the guy even today. You know, it's. Uh, I'm sure he exerted a considerable amount of control over her, you know, to say the least. She looks, I mean, if you see her in some of the, the appearances she made in some of the video, like Mondo Hollywood, her eyes just look like completely dead. I mean, she just looks like she's just completely zoned out. Well, you know, you know that, that interview that she did on the BBC, she looks like she's high as a kite or something. I mean, we thought she was either high or just completely mind-controlled. But uh, she's no, she like, didn't do drugs. She didn't even. She didn't. Even, she didn't. She tell you that she didn't even drink. I thought she told you that she didn't. Even drink. She may have said she did, but she did say no. She did say that they smoked pot, and that was it. Did she? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. She did admit that they used to smoke pot regularly, and but that was it. Uh, which which would uh, kind of fit that. that would actually kind of fit with you know with what I was saying earlier. You know, we uh, have been doing research on. Uh, the whole history of MK Ultra, et cetera. And there was this book that came out. Um, oh, gee, St. Peter's Snow. And uh, this guy, Alan Piper, wrote an article on it that was published last summer. And we wrote on it as well. But uh, in uh, uh, what was it? Five, uh, ten years before Albert Hoffman, quote unquote, invented LSD, was a book called St. Peter's Snow, published in Europe, that 
discusses a, a drug made from a fungus off of wheat being used to start a new world religion, etc. I mean, you know, and and they say that that Saint Peter's snow is what the the ergot was called in the Alps, who, <laughs> of course, LSD was supposedly invented in Switzerland. So it's a really tight little story, but it actually reveals that Albert Hoffman was not the inventor of, of LSD, that they had already known about it and been working on it for quite some time. But, you know, this whole storyline is this them starting a whole new religion and everything, and then you flash forward 80 years and you look at what happened and you look at what this book says you know they're talking about oh you know we can start a socialist revolution and we can get everybody believing in in god again so that we can lead them our way you know and it's uh, the book is by leo perutz but uh it, it's just it's it's just comical when you get the big picture of you know the whole agenda that they were selling and we think that we've provided uh, plenty of evidence to show that the true agenda was a uh, postmodernism or a neo-feudalism. Uh, they were selling the whole thing out of the Esalen Institute, all of these people centered around Esalen and SRI, etc. And um, all uh, all seem to be promoting this same agenda, the same neo-feudalism. And then you fast forward, we found a recording of uh, Terrence McKenna admitting that he was an agent and a PR guy, just like Edward Bernays. <laughs> and um, you know, so he's the one that created this idea of the archaic revival. Well, Gregory Bateson, who was one of the key founders of the MK Ultra program, uh, he was all into using anthropology to subvert our culture. And uh, there's uh, Did there's. Need- Oh, was me, was that uh, Margaret Mead's husband? Right, they're both just dad? they're they're both just yeah. dirty as hell. They were both at the uh, yeah. Macy conferences. I mean, these two people basically wanted to destroy society and everything in it. So Gregory Bates and uh, he created a, a native revival. Okay, and and so what they did is they basically the Soviets figured out that they could collide the their culture with the indigenous Siberian shamanic culture to keep them all under control. And so Gregory Bateson created the term native revivalism to do accomplish this. And then later McKenna remarketed this as our, the archaic revival. But, you know, we've also got uh, Timothy Leary in that uh, video uh, conversation on, on LSD. He admits in that video that he and, and Kesey and all of this guy, well, he says me, you know, he's talking about all of our agents and then he talks about, and those ones, you know, going all over the country on the bus, you know, it's like, or on buses, you know, it's like, who else is, hmm, let me think if I can figure this out. Ah, uh, Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters. So he admits right there in this video that they're all agents. And um, he's right there with uh, Humphrey Osmond and Oscar Yoniger and or Janiger and all of these guys, which shows that, you know, they this whole thing was orchestrated. Yeah, I believe very much so. You know, I mean, I yeah, I, I've uh, I've I've long believed that Leary and all of his associates were. You know, and I, it amazes me that, that so many people still defend him. You know, and then uh, try to uh, you know rationalize their way all of his various statements and actions. Dave, we think that the uh, prison break story is phony too. I mean, it's just so prepared, and. In a conversation on, on LSD, and and Joe Atwell and I have been working on another article on this, but in there, they talk about how uh, uh, you know how Leary's book on the prison break was one of the best books, and I've got it in his crap, and you know one of the best <laughs> prison break books ever written, and all of this nonsense, and they compare it to that movie in the from the seventies with Dustin Hoffman. I'm I'm forgetting the name off of my the top of my head, but you know they're comparing. Uh, yeah. uh, Dog Day Afternoon was it or no? no. It, um, it, I think it starts with a P or something like that. I'd have to pull it up on my other computer, but um. Yeah, I know which one you're talking about. I can't think of it right now. Right, you know, so they're they're comparing it to all of this, uh, you know, nonsense, and and he's like, oh, but your your story story is way better. And this is Humphrey Osmond talking. Of course, Humphrey Osmond and Aldous Huxley hired timothy leary to promote the whole drug scene they the two of them hired leary and then uh you know just uh i don't know if you heard my recent interview with uh uh, general albert stubblebine he was the 
uh, former head of uh, Army Intelligence, Global Army Intelligence, and he admitted on my show that Aldous Huxley was the guy in charge of MK Ultra. Oh, really? Yep. Uh, that's quite possible. Uh, and, you know, just strangely enough, both, uh, both uh, Huxley and Leary uh, show up in, uh, in the Laurel Canyon, uh, you know, narrative. Yep. In, yep. in various ways. Um, uh, one of the guys, I can't, God, who was it? Was it, uh, trying to think of who, one of the, one of the guys who later emerged as one of the, you know, big name, uh, you know, artists out of Laurel Canyon, musician, singer, songwriter, whatever, uh, was, it, was, was supposedly worked as a traveling salesman, um, before, uh, you know, his big break as a rock star. And uh, one of his claims to fame was that he he claimed that he had sold a vacuum cleaner to Aldous Huxley uh, at his home just months before he uh, died, you know, sure. uh, almost concurrently with JFK. And uh, also, uh, he, he his, did uh, die the same day he, as JFK, didn't he? Yeah, I know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, same day, like hours later, just hours after the assassination. Yeah, sure. he uh, turned up dead. Yeah. And also his uh, grand, his I think it was his granddaughter, uh, who I, whose name was who's known as Animal Huxley. I don't know if you've heard of her. She was uh, the longtime girlfriend of I think it was the bass player for uh, Steppenwolf for John uh-huh. Kay's band, one of the uh, look. So uh, so yeah, so you, you have uh, you know you have the, the Huxley influence, and uh, really actually lived in. Uh, Laurel Canyon kept a home in Laurel Canyon for a while before he later well, sure that's up, right up well north. you know you know that's uh, funny that you said that because uh, in 1994 there was I was working for the uh, you know prop 215 for medical marijuana and we uh, had a fundraiser at drumroll Timothy Leary's house in Laurel Canyon or in Beverly Hills wherever the hell it was and so you know I have a uh, a short little video of me in in Tim Leary's backyard smoking a joint with the guy from uh, like '94, and now I look back at that whole scene and what was going on, you know, when it was like, oh my God, we were just in a hornet's nest of CIA. It's like when I went to the the Maps conference a couple years ago, and I knew then that it, they were all CIA and Intel, but. You know, stepping back now and seeing the broader picture, it's like, oh my God, they really are. You know, these these guys really are intel, and they're, you know, that what they're doing is they sell the psychedelic drugs as, you know, the greatest new religion that's going to sell the save everyone. Meanwhile, their goal is to really dumb everyone down. Like Aldous Huxley in his book Moksha, he talks about uh, transcendence, spiritual transcendence, in, in his true idea of it. Actually meaning that you're so high and drugged out on quote-unquote soma that you don't care that you're a slave or you don't care about your social condition. And so, you know, he wanted to implement the brave new world on society and have, you know, the epsilons, the the deltas, the betas, the alphas, etc. And so then they could control uh, everybody. And, and essentially, this is why he was always promoting Eastern uh, uh, Hinduist uh, philosophies, because this is all based on the Hindu caste society. And you have the uh, Rig Vedic Soma. He's hanging out with uh, Gordon Wasson at the Century Club with Alan Dulles and Eisenhower and these guys. And um, uh, selling, you know, so he, he's, he's hang, hang, hangs out with Gordon Wasson at the Century Club. And then what does Gordon Wasson do? He writes a book that Amanita Muscaria is Soma, which is heavily attacked by many scholars today. It, you know, it was probably just a generic term for psychedelic or whatever. But, um, you know, so then Wasson, who's there, goes and creates the term that the or the book that that identifies in most people's minds that the Amanita muscaria mushroom is soma and you know it, it it just couldn't be any tighter a fit and then if you go up the ladder the other direction towards Aldous and Julian Huxley's uh, ancestors their grandfather was uh, Sir Thomas Henry Huxley who was uh, Darwin Charles Darwin's propaganda manager yeah, I know there's very close ties between the uh yeah, the the, the Darwin and uh, Huxley's and the uh 
who the, the Daltons, I think it is. Yeah, the, yes, all of the, yes, the yes. eugenics, uh, yeah, the big eugenics crowd. <laughs> yep, that's exactly that's exactly right. They're all eugenics, and you know they even uh, uh, Sir Thomas Henry Huxley created the quote unquote X Club, right, uh, to uh, promote uh, Darwin's work into society and social Darwinism. And so I, you know, I was like, what the hell does the X Club mean? And then of course you go and you look in the Bible, and X marks the spot. Anyone who is marked with the X is gonna die, and you know, and all of this kind of stuff. So they start the X club to go promote uh to send eight professors into key uh education centers to promote darwin's work and of course darwin had stolen it from wallace or whoever who stole it from immanuel kant and immanuel kant is one of the you know king's sophists of history is one of the, the wide now Oh, one of the leading sophists of, of history. You know, he, you know, it's like he, he, he's one of the founding uh, people to get us to try to not trust our own five senses and to not go look things up. You can't know truth, you know, and uh, that's a bit of a, a under summarization, but, um, I do recommend people check out, uh, David Harriman's research, the philosophic corruption of physics. And he goes through and he shows the progression from Immanuel Kant into all of this other stuff, uh, you know, and, and uh, just plug Darwin right in there. And they, they all, you know, kind of stem from uh, this one little tree, uh, all of these eugenicists, and they all seem to go back to uh, Immanuel Kant, who created the original ideas. Uh, yeah, it's a little beyond my uh, <laughs> current <laughs> research uh <laughs> well, well, that's all right. I'm just throwing it out there because it, you know it all just little, makes so little, many times. Yeah, it's a little, little deeper than I've uh, gone uh, yet. Yet, so, but uh, very interesting stuff, I got to say. So you know, you and I were talking before we had a conversation. Oh, back in March for maybe an hour or so, and uh, you know, you had talked about Stuart Copeland and Miles Copeland, how basically Miles had intentionally named his organizations, you know, FBI talent agency, and there was the police and all this kind of stuff. You want to talk about that? Yeah, that's uh, that's actually been integrated into the book. Um, you know, a lot of people have uh, asked me, you know, because this this this, this uh, you know before it was a book, it, it's been a web series that's been in development for I don't know like five or six years now. Sure. So it's it's been pretty well circulated, and I've gotten a lot of feedback on it. And one of the one of the questions that I get constantly is, "Are you going to do the same thing with?" And then there's a whole laundry list of, you know, are you going to do the same thing with the British invasion bands? Are you going to do the same thing with the Seattle grunge scene? Are you going to do the same thing with the punk and new wave scene? You know, and I get, you know, people are constantly asking me that and, uh, <laughs> which, you know, I'm sure would be fascinating to do, but you know, there's only so many hours in the day and so many more years left in my life and uh, a, lot, a lot of other conspiracies out there to look into. So I don't know that I'm inclined <laughs> to, Sure. To dig too deeply, but one thing that I did dig into a little bit was the punk and new wave scene because that was the one that kind of that kind of replaced uh, the Wall Canyon sounds. You know, the Wall Canyon uh, scene was was starting to fade away in the late seventies, early eighties is uh, is when we saw the punk and new wave thing that, come out, and, and that, that was, was Miles, sort of, right? Yeah, and that, that was, you know, the new way to rebel against the system, supposedly, you know, uh, the punk and new wave. And, uh, yeah, and what my research has revealed is that just to a remarkable, remarkable degree, that whole scene was really kind of created, nurtured, promoted, and, you know, every, every everything else by... Basically, one family, the Copeland family, the three sons of uh, Miles X. Copeland Jr., who was a very high-level intelligence operative in uh, one of the found he was founding the founder. members of the OSS. What's that? Yeah, I was going to say he was the key founder of the OSS and a founding member of the CIA. Yeah, absolutely. He served as station chief throughout the Middle East, in in Egypt, and in uh, Lebanon, and various hot spots around the Middle East. He was a key 
player in, in various coups down there, you know, the one that installed uh, Nasser, the one that toppled uh, Mossadi, and, you know, he, he was a major, major player throughout the Middle East and, and Northern Africa uh, for many, 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 many years. And his wife was the equally highly placed uh, British intelligence operative. So uh, they both had uh, sterling intelligence pedigrees, and they had three sons, Stuart, Miles the Third, and uh, Ian. And the three of them, I mean, just uh, to a remarkable degree, shaped that whole scene. You know, Miles uh, opened, uh, started up um, uh, IRS Records, International Records Syndicate, I think it was called, the IRS Records, which ended up signing and recording and promoting just... Uh, an incredibly large percentage of the big names uh, that came out of that punk and new wave scene. And then meanwhile, uh, Brother Ian founded uh, Frontier Booking International, a talent agency that went by the acronym FBI, and they were the ones who you know signed and managed and handled most of these same bands. And then uh, Brother Stewart, of course, uh, formed the police. He was the founding member of the police. He's the one that came up with the idea and came up with the name and the logo and all that. And now we have Sting, who travels around selling UNESCO and the UN's agenda to the world and helping, uh, yeah, no. you know, helping Daniel <laughs> so Pinchbeck three... and Reality Sandwich sell 2012. But you, 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 you have these three sons from the CIA father who founded these three entities named the FBI, the police, and the IRS. <laughs> and between those three entities, they just had a major influence on on launching and shaping and nurturing that that whole scene. I mean, it's hard to find a big name act from that era who did not have some. Uh, you know, some connection to, to such a degree that the, the manager of the clash once publicly st- said that uh, that he suspected that they were part of some CIA conspiracy to create and and, and form this scene, you know, because they just were so fully integrated into it in every way, shape, and form. Sure, so, and then um, there was... There was um... Uh, oh goodness! Uh, the the Cure B fifty twos they sold. Uh, they also sold. Uh, oh, you know one of one of my old favorite bands. You know the who were they? Uh, Black Coffee in Bed and uh, uh, Pulling Muscles from a Shell and all of that stuff. You know, uh, so all of these bands uh, were promoted directly by the Copeland family which is all tied into the CIA and uh, Intel. Well, the founding people. Oh yeah, CIA I mean and Intel. I mean these three kids grew up literally within the CIA family, you know, they lived with their father in various embassies, you know, they were friends with the kids from other, you know, the one of them the 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 uh the oldest one, Miles uh, the third the first company that he launched before he went into the music business was a security consulting firm in the Middle East, which his partner was like the son of the chief of uh, Egypt's intelligence services. He had these two sons of the intelligence services opening up a private security consulting firm in the Middle East. And, um, he was known, it was well known that, that Miles routinely answered the phone with the greeting, hello, this is the CIA, how can I help you? <laughs> you know, it, it, purportedly as a joke, that's how he would answer the phone at his offices. And then from there, he went into being a music mogul, you know. <laughs> from that, from this background, growing up in, in these hot spots around the world, living in U.S. embassies under, you know, armed guard and, and, you know, all of this uh, political subterfuge going on, coups and plots and whatnot, and his father constantly being involved in this stuff, and then himself getting into the security consulting business, and then from that, somehow he he uh, becomes this, this huge titan of the music industry that shapes the whole, you know, new wave movement. And, you know, the other brother, Ian... He voluntarily enlisted to go and serve in uh, Vietnam, did intelligence work over in Vietnam, and uh, liked it so much that he tried to re-enlist. You know, he was gung-ho. While, while everybody else in the country is 
desperately trying to avoid the draft, this guy goes and, and signs up and volunteers to serve in an elite intelligence unit over there. And then afterwards, you know, he decides that he's going to be a, a music mogul as well. You know? So, I mean, there's just no real natural progression from their background and their early, you know, history to what they became, you know, it, it just doesn't seem to really fit at all that that these would be the guys that, and then you, you have know, the, and then you have the clubs that explode onto the sunset strip and hollywood boulevard etc in the early 60s that all just you know mushroom out like you said earlier pun intended i'm sure so you know what do you what do you think about uh let me ask you this why don't we get into people like um and you mentioned charles manson earlier what about him and christopher walken and uh Roman Polanski, you know, those guys. Yeah, well, but, you know, again, they were also a huge part of launching this scene. Um, you know, a lot of the so-called young Turks, Dennis Hopper, Warren Beatty, uh, Peter and Jane Fond, uh, Jack Nicholson, Bruce Dern, um, Sharon Tate, <laughs> all, all those people who were very much a part of the Laurel Canyon scene, and, and many of them lived in Laurel Canyon. Peter Fonda, in fact, was became such a key part of the scene that he actually recorded an entire solo folk rock album under his own name that, that mercifully was never released. But, uh, yeah, he was so so close to the scene that he wanted to be one of them. And uh, but anyway, they they were uh, they were the other key draw that really launched these. Um, bands because they would regularly go out to the clubs and it was widely publicized that they were going out to the clubs so you know initially at least a lot of the people that were going out going out you know hitting out to the Sunset Strip and hitting up these new clubs that were just starting to make a name for themselves they weren't, they weren't there because they wanted to hear the birds you know they were there, as I mentioned before, because they wanted to see this crazy acid-drenched spectacle going on on the dance floor, but also because they had, they had an opportunity to rub elbows with Steve McQueen or Warren Beatty or Jane Mansfield or one of these larger-than-life stars that were out mingling in the clubs with normal, everyday people. And they did it routinely, and it was very well publicized. You know, they've never, you would never see a big star do that now. You know, they don't even leave the house without an entourage, you know, but but these people were just spilling out into the clubs on a nightly basis and um and then played, you know, a key role in launching this whole scene. And uh, you know, the interesting thing about that is if you look into the backgrounds of these people, almost every single one of them is the son or daughter of an intelligence officer, you know. Uh, Dennis Hopper, before he died, admitted that his dad was an OSS officer. You know, Sharon Tate's dad was Lieutenant Colonel Paul Tate of the U.S. Air Force Intelligence, I believe it was. Uh, Bruce Dern's uncle was like Skull and Bones. Uh, you know, and right, right on down the line, every single one of these people, you know, uh, come from that same, you know, that same background. And, you know, that, that can't possibly be a coincidence that this canyon filled up with rock stars and actors who all came from, you know, from that very same background. And um, so, yeah, so, so, so that was a key part of the scene as well. You know, that it was a key part of... Uh, of making a name for these bands, a key reason that they got as, as big and popular as they did. Uh, uh, one of the main reasons that the sunset strip scene happened at all, you know, cause like I said before, these, these were new clubs that nobody had heard of and new bands that nobody had heard of. And, you know, this was a whole new thing and they needed some way to get that launched. And the way they did that is, through exploiting the popularity of these young movie stars and by putting together this troupe of crazed uh, dancers who would go out in these wild clothes and wild hair and, and put on these this just bizarre uh, spectacles on the dance floor and um, so that that was that was that was how the scene originally got kickstarted by uh, not by the bands themselves, but 
by the club owners who had the amazing foresight to open these clubs just in time to catch the wave, and by the Hollywood stars and the freaks who showed up to, uh, you know, attract attention and get, you know, and, and uh, attract media attention and, and uh, get people to want to come out to these clubs to see what the heck was going on there. You come up with uh, some new stuff recently that I heard regarding Stephen Still and David Crosby. Would you talk about them? Uh, Stephen Still's dad was apparently some type of mercenary uh, with, uh, you know, sort of, sort of a soldier of fortune, so to speak, who uh, appears to have been frequently involved in hot spots down in Central America, um, El Salvador, I think, and uh, Panama Canal Zone, and a few other places. Uh, you know, where, wherever there was, wherever there was some kind of CIA plots brewing, he seemed to show up. And uh, so Stephen, consequently, relocated quite frequently, and at times lived uh, with his father down in, uh, you know, like military type housing in uh, various hot spots in, in uh, Central America. And he later claimed to various people when he would be, uh, you know, particularly drunk or high or whatever, he would sometimes regale people with stories about how he had served, in, that he had actually been a uh, operative in Vietnam in the early years, in the very early 60s. And uh, you will find references to that in biographies of him and, and uh, you know, other, other uh, writings on the era. And they're always dismissed. Everybody always dismisses them and says, well, you know, that couldn't, couldn't you know, it was just drug-fueled delusions. It was, you know, just idle boasting or whatever. Although it was kind of a weird thing to boast about when you were an icon of anti-war crowd, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but... Uh, and and it's, it's it's always been written off because it's claimed that it couldn't have possibly happened because by the time there were foot soldiers in Vietnam, uh, Stephen Stills was was already in the public eye as part of Buffalo Springfield, and he remained in the public eye thereafter. So obviously, there's no way that he could have actually served in Vietnam. But what all those explanations always ignore is the fact that. We had people in Vietnam for many years before that under various covers, you know, working as trainers, advisors, engineers, whatever, whatnot. You know, we had, we had, we had covert operatives in there for a very long time. And given still, you know, uh, upbringing and background, he would have made the perfect, you know, the perfect age. He would have been the perfect choice for such an assignment. So, to me, it's not at all beyond the realm of possibility that maybe he actually did, you know. And, you know, it's impossible for me to say, obviously, whether he did or not. But uh, I'm not inclined to dismiss those stories as quickly as everyone else seems to be. Because it does, to me, it seems like it's, it could actually fit. And, you know, it could explain a lot of things. Sure, and, but, uh, you know, there... Uh, let me just interject here. There, are, we've seen photos of David Crosby and his father, who is an intel agent. And David Crosby looks like, um, you know, uh, Davy Crockett with the, you know, with the the buckskin and all of this stuff on, right? And when you think of the whole neo feudalist or new dark age agenda that you know that we talked about recently in our manufacturing the deadhead article. That whole thing completely fits, you know, their whole look and, and dress and all of that, again, fits right in just like... Yeah, I, I, have, I have a picture, it, it opens the book, actually, it's in the very front of the book, my publisher wanted to put it in there, of, uh, of Jim Morrison in uh, January 1964 on the, on the bridge of the... Um, USS Bonham Richard, or what I think it was called, the ship that his, his dad was the commander of. And it was taken uh, just before his dad, uh, <laughs> just, before the, just before the ship sailed out for the Tonkin Gulf and what would ultimately become the Tonkin Gulf incident. And just months before Jim himself emerged, uh, you know, as uh, the Lizard King. And it's just startling that the metamorphosis that this guy went through in like a year's time is just absolutely uncanny. You look at this picture and he's just this very clean cut, 
collegiate looking conservative, you know, kid. And then, you know, he, he just emerges as, as something entirely different, just like a year later as this fully formed, uh, you know, uh, rock god. And then not many years after that, in his final years, he formed once again into this overweight, hairy, uh, you know, reclusive poet. You know, so, I mean, it's just this, a remarkably short span, like in six years' time or something, you had three completely different incarnations of Jim Morrison that, I mean, in some of the pictures, you'd never even know. It doesn't even look like the same person. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing, um, you know, the, the, that he was able to just completely reinvent himself to such a degree, uh, and more than once. Which is why I have never really had a problem with the the quote unquote conspiracy theory that says that he faked his death and reinvented himself as something else entirely different because he certainly had the capacity to do such a thing. But well, sure, and and wasn't his death wasn't his death timed exactly with the retirement of his dad's boat that launched Gulf of Tonkin? And speaking of which. Uh, in my interview with yeah, well, Supalakis, the, the same, the very same day. Yeah, his dad gave like some kind of commencement speech on the very day that he supposedly died. Well, wasn't died, it like yeah. the same hour or same minute or something? But even uh, uh, you know, Supalakis in my interview with her tried to deny that the Gulf of Tonk- Tonkin had anything to do with officially getting us into Vietnam. I know, I know, I know. Yeah, she was way off on her timeline on Vietnam too. So yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I caught that. So yeah, well, you know what are you gonna say? <laughs> like I said, there's not there's not a lot in that interview, unfortunately, that uh, that has enough credibility to be of much use. So right, yeah, that's his life. <laughs> well, yeah. well, you know, let's uh, you know Jim Morrison. So let's go into the possible faking of his death. What do you what do you have on that? And you know, we've basically come to the same conclusions on that as you. You know, he has said that he was on record as saying that he could see himself, you know, reinvent, reinventing himself and being comfortable uh, as like a corporate executive, you know, like a Wall Street type person. And I, you know, I, <laughs> it seems entirely credible to me, you know. I mean, I, I, I think his whole thing as a rock star was uh, was a sham to begin with, you know. I mean, the guy had just, a, just the most unlikely history for someone to, who emerged as a rock star. I mean, in interviews, he acknowledged that he never studied music. He did not know how to read or write music. He never learned to play an instrument, had no interest in learning to play an instrument. Before joining the Doors, he'd never sung. He didn't even much listen to music. He said he'd only been to one or two concerts in his life. So he'd spent no time around bands. He you know, never really much experienced live music. He didn't even listen to much recorded music. He'd never sung. He didn't play an instrument. He couldn't read or write music. I mean, the, the guy had no interest in, by all accounts, by all accounts, until all of a sudden he decides to transform from this kid that's in this picture from 1964 into Jim Morrison, the rock god. Just out of nowhere, he suddenly becomes interested and wants to, and then after a couple of years of that, he just as quickly loses interest decides that he's no longer a rock star and he just wants to be a poet and just wants to be left alone, and, and, then, he, and then he supposedly dies. So, you know, and to me, it all adds up to the whole Doors thing was a sham and he did his thing and then went on to do something else, and who knows what. But, you know, as far as hard evidence of that, you know, that, that's, a whole nother, that's a whole nother issue entirely, you know. I mean... Uh, there were very few witnesses, you know. I mean, uh, it was the whole thing was was done in a very hush hush manner, you know, with no autopsy, no viewing of the body, and not even any announcement that he was dead until his body was in the ground. And uh, the whole thing just really, uh, really doesn't add up for me on a, on a whole lot of levels. But <laughs> I don't know. What's your, what's your take? 
Oh, we agree with you that, you know, and we think that the, you know, the timing with uh, the retirement of his dad, Ship, and uh, Jim Morrison, you know, his dad officially gets us into the Vietnam War, and then G- Jim becomes the official look and ro- role model of the anti-war movement. I, almost simultaneously, I mean, just to an uncanny degree. Talk about, talk about uh, Hegelian dialectic, huh? What's that? I said talk about Hegelian dialectic, you know, problem, reaction, solution, right? Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's uh, it's all just a little too convenient. The the timing and uh, all the all the interconnections and uh, his whole life arc. It's just uh, it just doesn't add up, you know. <laughs> that uh, <laughs> so, but then again, you know, I mean, for for most of these bands, I mean, if you look if you look at the history of how these bands came together and how quickly they came together and achieved fame. It's just, it's, uh, it just doesn't add up. It just seems entirely manufactured. You know, the more you look at it, the more, you know, even, even going beyond the fact that these people all had very sinister family connections, uh, just the way that the scene developed, the, the, the speed with which these bands just came together and were, you know, ushered into a recording studio like within weeks of forming. And, you know, I mean, the Buffalo Springfield was just, just bizarre. It's just mind boggling. Well, you know, sure. you read well, the timeline of. of I was just going to say, well, it, in my interview with Sue. She says that uh, the birds moved next door to them, and the drummer had never played drums before. He literally just picked up the drumsticks, walked into his studio, and became a rock star. Exactly. That is absolutely true. Absolutely true. Michael Clark had never held a pair of drumsticks in his hands. He had played like bongos on the beach or something, you know, as a beatnik dude or something. But he had never had this, uh, and in fact, he didn't even own a drum set in their early, in their early, uh, sessions. He kept time by, uh, just tapping, uh, pounding on cardboard boxes with his hands. You know, the guy had no concept of being a drummer. And their bass player had never played a bass. Chris Hillman, who, he was a bluegrass musician, a mandolin player, and a very good one considered a virtuoso mandolin player, but a mandolin is a far cry from an ba- electric bass guitar. And the dude had never picked up a bass guitar in his life, and yet this band, you know, was th- thrown together and, you know, into the recording studio within, like, weeks. You know, they had a name, they had a first single, they had a, you know, a record company behind them, and they had recording sessions, and half the band had never even played <laughs> Or the entire rhythm section had never even played their instruments before. You know, I mean, it was just absurd. And even, you know, Crosby wasn't that great a musician either. You know, he's a rhythm guitarist at best. And uh, and Gene Clark, who, uh, who was their best songwriter and probably their best singer, uh, he he wasn't really much, you know, he, he could strum along a little bit, but, I mean, he was basically relegated to playing the tambourine. You know, so the only guy in that entire band who was actually a musician was uh, Jim McGuinn, who became Roger McGuinn, who was a very good 12-string guitar player, but he was the only one, you know. <laughs> the other four uh, had no clue what they were doing, and which is why on their early albums they aren't actually playing. They're, they're studio musicians, the same studio musicians that played on the Monkees. Out. You know, the monkeys got all kinds of flack for being a fake band, but the reality is that at least half of the Royal Canyon bands were just as bad and had to have studio musicians uh, put down, play their parts for them because they just were not really qualified to be doing what they were doing. You know, so how did that happen? You know, I mean, if you're putting together a band, why would you draft a bass player and a drummer? Who, have, you know, there was plenty of, of session musicians in L.A. that they could have recruited, but they were after a look. They were after an image. They were after something other than, you know. So, yeah, so, so they basically they would basically cast these people to play these parts as well as, you know, as, as if they were casting actors, because that's essentially what they were doing. 
And so, yeah, I mean, a lot of these bands just were not what they, uh, you know, what we think of, of them being today, you know. And, you know, the music sounds great. On um, you know, I mean, there's a quote from some drummer, famous drummer, for one of the bands, and uh, I wish I had it handy, but basically what he said was that he was devastated to learn that the ten best drum that his ten favorite drummers of all time were actually all one guy <laughs> who was the drummer for the Wrecking Crew who played for the birds and the mothers or the uh the mamas and the papas and the doors and all kinds of the monkeys and all kinds of you know, a lot of the songs that, that still to this day play daily on classic radio stations are being played by Hal Blaine and the rest of his wrecking crew. They are not being played by the musicians that everybody thinks they were played by. So there was a very, very synthetic quality to these bands, how they were put together and how quickly they achieved fame, despite the fact that they had no previous experience playing their in instruments and didn't have any equipment or anything else. Nevertheless, they immediately got backing from the major, you know, studios. They were outfitted with equipment. They were given, you know, uh, rehearsal time and recording time and, and uh, you know, uh, promoted into these major stars despite the fact that they were certainly not the most talented musicians in the country, you know. Their fame was not based on, on their talent, at least initially, you know. And some of them did learn. You know, Chris Hillman eventually became a very good bass player, you know. Dennis Wilson of the Beach Boys is considered by some people to have matured ultimately into a pretty good drummer. But in the beginning, he had no clue what he was doing. None of them did, you know. So, uh, yeah, there was a very, very synthetic uh, nature, and, and, and a lot of what people were hearing was actually not being performed by the people that they thought, you know, on their records. Of course, in their live performances, you know, it was actually the band. But then again, you had all these other distractions going on that were, you know, uh, preventing the people from really listening that closely to how bad the music was. So, um, and I was getting in trouble because <laughs> people just have such a reverence for uh, a lot of these artists. Classic that rock. Uh, well, you know, let me let me just yeah. say this, beca and and I, here's why I think it is. You know, obviously, this entire thing from the '60s, late '60s, early '70s was manufactured and sold to us, which also explains why uh, uh, they repeat the exact same music on these radio stations every day for the last uh, you know 50 plus years. And so, what they've done is they've basically gotten most of society caught in a time warp where they're just playing the same music over and over and over and nothing sort of changes. They want people caught in that 60s psychedelic state of mind, that archaic revival that they were trying to push on us back then. And, uh, you know, there was uh, Jim Ladd, uh, you know, and, and interestingly, he was at uh, Tim Leary's house that day. But uh, he did, uh, you know, he was one of these early guys who created, uh, you know, one of the early counterculture head figures. And uh, he did a show in the late 70s that I've got a copy of uh, regarding the origins of FM radio. And uh, the issue was is that AM radio was mono, but, uh, you know, what they needed was to uh, synchronize the hemispheres of the brain using beats of music, and they couldn't do it with the mono music. So they literally, and at the time there was only two FM stations around, they literally created the FM radio networks to then sell the rock and roll on top of it with it across the nation, and then globally. I did not know that. That doesn't surprise me, but um, I'll 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 uh, have yeah, to. I mean, I'll, I'll get you a copy of this uh, Jim Ladd talk. I think you're going to be floored because when you plug in what you know and what I know and what we've been putting all together on this and fit what he's saying in that, you know, of course, you know, he's in there talking about how wonderful all of these musicians are, right? 
But if you just go through and read in between the lines and put in our research, you can see you know, a, a much clearer agenda of what was behind pushing FM radio. And then we have the same, uh, I mean, look what they, look what they did to the black musicians in the eighties and nineties. I mean, you have this, this beautiful black music that comes out of the, you know, tens, twenties, thirties, forties, and then it becomes gangster rap and just this crap for a while, you know, and uh, it's always leading yeah. towards this degradation. They're always Pushing, 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 degradation, dumb people down, you know, wreck their lives. Let's get them caught into crap, you know? Yeah, it's, uh, I, you know, I mean, I, I will say this, that, that, that um, as much as I believe that the 60s scene was manufactured and that it was based more on who these people were and who they knew than what their actual talent was, Overall, there was I, there seems to have been a lot more talent in the '60s than there is now. I mean, if you look at you look at the current crop of people who are like storming the charge, people have been who have been you know manipulated into superstar stat, status. What about Miley Cyrus? Not, like, out of no, yeah, like, out of nowhere, you have these instant stars like Miley Cyrus and Lady Gaga and Rihanna and Beyonce and Jay Z and. And uh, I don't know, whoever the hell else is out there. And it certainly isn't based on their talent. I mean, you certainly, I, you would have a hard time making the argument that these people rose to the top of their field because they're the most talented people that we have to offer. You know, I, I, <laughs> this it's is becoming the best more society. and more obvious that that isn't the case, that it's not based on talent, that it's based on other factors. And the symbolism and the, the the blatant ways in which these people are now promoting an agenda is just uh, mind boggling. So uh, you know, the '60s almost as manufactured and as contrived and as controlled as it was, it, it seems almost almost innocent you know, to, compared to what we're seeing out there today. You know. Sure. Well, you know, and it, you go back and you read Edward Bernays, and he lays it all out there. I mean, he admitted that they had to create these idols to give the people gods, to give them the illusion of religion. And uh, that's what they were doing out there. And, and also another issue that I often think of about all of this is what they're playing on is the, you know, primates have alphas and betas and whatnot. So basically an alpha uh, who has ill intentions uses a lot of peacocking. And when you look at... Uh, all of the Hollywood stars, they all use this peacocking. Lady Gaga, Miley Cyrus, they're all about the peacocking and, and looking big. You know, it's like a cop. You know, a cop puts on a Halloween costume and a, and a badge and a bulletproof vest underneath and he's all puffed up and he looks big and everybody, oh, look at him. You know, he, he can commit crimes that he would never commit <laughs> otherwise if he didn't have that Halloween costume on, if he wasn't all puffed up, you know. And so, uh, you know, you know, this is the, the whole thing. I think, it, you know, the, the whole alpha beta relation to primates and peacocking is key. And so, you know, we just need to get the betas to, you know, and the epsilons and deltas from Huxley to, uh, wake up and realize that the peacocking is just a show. And, you know, you don't need to go waste your energy screaming after people that are put there to mislead you and to prevent you from seeing how you're being manipulated. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. It's, it's a weird world we live in these days. I just, uh, some of the stuff that passes for entertainment is just, um, it's just mind boggling to me. I just, I don't know. I don't know what to say about uh, the state of the quote-unquote arts nowadays. It's uh, we're definitely being sold the anti-hero more and more. You know, it's uh, there's been a huge shift in that direction to where we're, we're more and more encouraged to to root for people that we would have never rooted for. You know, like ten, twenty years ago. Sure. You know, like meth dealers and. And mafia kingpins and, and, uh, serial killers, you know. They had Dexter, serial killer is hero, and the mob boss, Tony Soprano is hero, Walter White is hero, you know, it's, it's, it's unbelievable now. I mean, the degree to which people who, you know, we would have had no, no respect, no sympathy for 10, 20 years ago are now our new, uh, 
our new icons, our new sure. heroes, our new role models almost, you know? It's funny that you said Dexter because I was just going to throw that out when you said it. And, um, <laughs> yeah, it definitely I fits. hate that show. <laughs> that, show that show just appalls me. You know, I spent years researching serial killers and, and that whole sordid slimy world and yeah to see you know one glorified as some sort of anti-hero in, in this ridiculous plot line uh, that show just uh I, yeah i never never had any yeah i lost you you there <laughs> there you are yeah i'm here uh you you just dropped out for a second but yeah it's you know it's really no. interesting but it's always promoting the degradation of society. If you look at it from one angle, you don't see it. But if you look at this multi-pronged attack on us that they're constantly hitting us and trying to degrade us, you know, if you just look at the, you know, the, uh, you know, tribal, uh, you know, silver dollar size ear piercings and stuff that people walk around with now, if you just look at that, you don't see it. You know, it's not the one thing. It's, it's these many things that they use to attack us. And when you put it all together, you can see the bigger picture. Um, you know, who was, uh, let me ask you, who was, uh, Paul Rothschild? Paul Rothschild was the producer of The Doors and of Love and, uh, for a time of Janis Joplin, actually. He was a major mover and shaker behind the scenes. He had come out of the, uh, Cambridge folk scene where he worked at the uh, famous, uh, I think it was Club 47, which was sort of the hub of the whole folk movement in Cambridge, which really in large part gave birth to the Laurel Canyon movement. I mean, the Laurel Canyon basically was created by taking the folk music of Cambridge and electrifying it and uh, turning it into something much different. And uh, so he came out of that scene and uh, had not been able to come up with a whole lot of information on him, although he did uh, serve in an intelligence unit. Um, according to a little blurb that I found in, of all places, Sports Illustrated, you, know, you never know where you're going to find little nuggets of truth here and there, and uh, you know, would, would never have expected to be looking in Sports Illustrated to research a uh, you know, book on the Laurel Canyon music scene, manipulation of the Laurel Canyon music scene, but... Uh, you know, a little blurb that was in there it was a writer by the name of Barney uh, Rostang, Rostang, I'm not sure how he pronounces his name, but uh, he revealed in there that he had actually served in the very same intelligence unit as Paul Rothschild, strangely enough. Um, so here's this guy, and you know, yet again, came from an intelligence background, was trained in, in, in some type of intelligence work. And then emerged as a major mover and shaker behind the scenes in the Laurel Canyon music scene, launching, uh, you know, uh, two of the biggest bands that came out of there, Love with Arthur Lee and uh, The Doors with uh, our buddy Jim Morrison, and also uh, Janis Joplin for a while. So uh, a major mover and shaker. And we're... And, uh, he became, basically, you know, he came out of this intelligence unit and, and became what many people would, back then would have probably described as sort of a demonic rock producer. He didn't have a real good, you know, real good reputation. He was pretty, uh, you know, pretty uh, difficult guy to deal with, apparently, and... Um, so he had quite a reputation, and weirdly enough, this guy, this other guy, Barney uh, Rustang, who uh, served in the same intelligence unit as him, ended up writing the mass market paperback uh, book um, *Phantom of the Paradise* from the movie that starred uh, Paul Williams, who was also a, a Laurel Canyon uh, resident, and that movie was about. Um, a demonic uh, uh, rock music producer, a guy who basically sold his soul to the devil for fame and fortune and was trying to convince this other uh, kid to, to do likewise. And so, weirdly enough, out of this very same intelligence unit, you have one guy who becomes sort of this uh, demonic rock music producer and another guy who writes a novel about a demonic rock music producer, you know, both out of the same intelligence unit. Um, so, yeah, that doesn't always really seem like a coincidence to me. <laughs> you know, then again, I'm I, a suspicious mind the kind of guy, but uh, things like that just don't seem like they would happen by chance, you know. 
I think there was a definite agenda, uh, you know, being pursued there. So that's the uh, the Paul Rothschild story, kind of in a nutshell. <laughs> what did he you? Was not, but he was not. Now he was not, as far as I know, his name is not spelled with an S. It's uh, spelled differently than the Rothschild banking family. And as far as I know, he was he is not a member of the Rothschild banking family, but. It could be mistaken. I mean, it's possible that he changed his name, you know, the spelling of his name somewhere along the line. But well, didn't the, the family make, read, he was, didn't the family make that name up though from Red Shield or Rose Shield? So uh, I mean, it, you know, wasn't the name just uh, created only like a couple of hundred years ago? So wouldn't they all be? I'm just thinking that they would probably all be related if the name was created. You know what I mean? You know, I, I, I don't know. It's quite possible. It's, uh, you know, the, the sources that I've read say that he wasn't, but, you know, I wouldn't rule it out. Um, it's quite possible, you know. I mean, it would not, it wouldn't shock me in the least. And, and, it, and it wouldn't be the first time that that name popped up in this, uh, this storyline. Um, Henry Fonda, one of his wives, was uh, Countess Albera Franchetti, who was um, not only the daughter of one of the top advisors to fascist dictator Mussolini, but was also a Rothschild. She was a descendant of uh, Louise Rothschild, Sarah Roth, one of the Roth, one of the prominent Rothschilds. So. Um, there are Rothschilds in the in the Fonda family tree that gave birth to you know Peter and Jane who were who were part of the scene. So um, yeah, so you know uh, Henry Fonda, Henry Fonda, squeaky clean liberal image may be a little uh, may have been a little off actually <laughs> based on some of the stuff that he seems to have uh, gotten himself into. But anyway, uh, the point is that the the the, the Rothschild name does pop up. Elsewhere, at least I think in, on another occasion too, but I can not can't quite place it right now. But it definitely does pop up in the storyline. But whether Paul Rothschild was was one of them, I really can't say with any certainty whatsoever. So. Do you know anything about uh, William Mulholland and his ties to MK Ultra and the CIA? No, uh, uh, I mean I know who William Mulholland was, but no, I'd never heard of, I'd never read or heard anything about him in that. Context. You know, and apparently uh, both he and Houdini were often, uh, you know, taught agents how to do sleight of hand and how to steal things and pickpocket and and do this sort of stuff, right? You know, so Mulholland gets a street named after him, and in fact, didn't uh, Huxley also live on Mulholland Drive for a while? Quite possibly, it's probably where he was living when uh, when he got sold. Supposedly, got sold a vacuum cleaner. You know? Right. Uh, he's living somewhere very, yeah, somewhere very close, somewhere right in right right in the area where all of this was going on. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly where, but yeah. So. <laughs> all right. So, uh, what do you know about Houdini? Houdini, uh, he was an interesting guy to say the least. Um, he was by uh, by the accounts of a couple of authors who did an extensive amount of research on him, and, and he received corroboration from both Scotland Yard and from John McLaughlin, uh, former uh, honcho at the CIA, that uh, Harry Houdini was a covert operative working for U.S. intelligence, Scotland Yard, and for an international police agency. And that his traveling magic act was in large part a cover for covert uh, operations, you know. And um, they point out a number of interesting things about him, like how his meteoric rise to fame, first of all, which, you know, would be paralleled by the Laurel Canyon crowd many decades later, because this was way back in like the 1890s. And uh, he had been a struggling. Uh, Magician, you know, just just an unknown slate of hand artist. Nothing, nothing exceptional about him at all. Uh, he'd been struggling, living hand to mouth. He and his wife, you know, at times he'd had to take work as a circus freak just to put food on the table, and uh, you know, it was just not no real career prospects for him whatsoever until the day that he 
walked into uh, Chicago police headquarters and met with a guy by the name of Wilkie, who uh, who was who would uh, become the head of the U.S. Secret Service and was at the time like the probably the most uh, prominent uh, quote unquote intel operative. Uh, at the time, and uh, one, as soon as he fell into Wilkie's orbit, he immediately started getting massive press coverage, front page press coverage, and within a year, he was the highest paid entertainer and the most celebrated entertainer in the country, um, making tons of money and just, you know, like out of nowhere. He went from poverty to superstardom in like a year. And then bizarrely, as soon as he had done that, he took off. He packed up and sailed off for Europe for like a few years, which in those days was like career suicide, basically, because there was no real, you know, uh, cross, uh, cross culture or community, you know, entertainment, so to speak, in those days. You know, they had their people, we had ours, and we were separated by a big wide ocean. And, um, so, you know, leaving this lucrative career that he had in America to go over to Europe where he was completely unknown and had no prospects whatsoever was a very, very strange thing to do, to say the least. It was it would have normally meant career suicide but for a he guy was, who was, he was doing he, Intel and, and it wasn't he breaking out when he was, he was supposedly doing, doing a was, show and then go steal some documents or something and then slip back into his uh his uh, that's escape what, outfit. Yeah, he would frequently yeah, he would frequently perform on stage, like behind a curtain or inside a box or whatever it is, and doing these very long, elaborate escapes where he would be out of view of the audience for extended periods of time, you know, and uh, just, which was generally considered to be just to sort of build suspense. You know, basically these people would sit there for like an hour staring at an empty stage, you know, waiting to see if he emerged. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, what these authors have suggested and and have uh, you know provided some corroboration for is that he very likely was slipping out through a trap door and going off and doing whatever he was doing and coming back and, and slipping into a box and, uh, or behind the curtain or whatever the case was and and that it was the perfect cover because obviously someone can't be in two places at once and if you're on a stage being observed by hundreds of people you certainly can't be off somewhere else you know, doing some kind of clandestine activity. So it was the perfect cover. And um, and no sooner did he arrive, and as soon as he arrived in uh, England, within like days, he met with a guy by the name of William Melville, who was uh, Wilkie's counterpart in the UK. He was the head of a special branch of Scotland Yard, and, you know, an early version of the, uh, what would become, uh, you know, MI5 or MI6 or whatever the hell it is. And so he was the, you know, the top ranking, uh, counterpart, uh, in, in the UK. And the same thing happened. As soon as he met with this guy, all of a sudden he's being celebrated as the greatest thing since sliced bread and, and, uh, became a huge star overnight in the UK. And then he went to Germany and the same thing. And then he went to Russia, same thing. And he went to, you know, <laughs> and everywhere. They just rolled out the red carpet for this guy, gave him massive publicity, hailed him as the greatest entertainer of all time. And uh, the whole time he was, you know, uh, by these authors' accounts, he was doing intel work. And that's why he was, you know, welcomed with open arms and, and, and heavily promoted and whatnot because he was working within an intel network you know and all the people around his booking agent was intel and you know all the people around him on the uh during his travels and all the people he met with uh you know were were very highly placed intelligence operatives so um didn't he didn't he spend yeah, time I, did he spend time debunking the spiritualist movement too or am i confusing him with someone yeah, yeah, that was, yeah, that's how he spent his closing years, actually, his last several years, that was his main preoccupation, was uh, debunking the spiritualist movement, which was huge in, like, the 1920s. Like uh, it is the now. Late teens and 20s. Yeah, because after World War One, when World War One ended in, what, 1918, I think, uh, you know, we had a lot of casualties, we lost a lot of people over there, and, and uh a lot of people were very quick to exploit that by claiming that they could put 
these grieving families in touch with the uh, family members that had been lost during the war, you know. And so you had all these mediums popping up and this whole spiritualist movement developing and, and making a lot of money off of people's grief. And uh, so Harry Houdini was supposedly going to debunk that, and he, he did a lot of work. But, you know, ultimately, as with everything, you know, there's no such thing as bad publicity, you know. Any publicity is good publicity, as they say. And and ultimately, what he ended up doing was, was heightening even more so the, the awareness of the uh, of the spiritualist movement, you know which contained a lot of big names, and, and some of his best friends were members of this, this movement that he was supposedly trying to debunk. You know, people like Arthur Conan Doyle, creator of uh, Sherlock Holmes, was uh, one of the main movers and shakers behind the, uh, the spiritualist movement and also a very close friend of Harry Houdini. So, you know, you got to wonder how sincere his efforts really were. But, yeah, that's, that's what he always spent his... His final years, and according to some people, that's why he was killed, because uh, because of his uh, investigations into the spiritualist movement. Speaking of Sherlock Holmes, there's another show that they literally remake every single year. I know, don't they? <laughs> yeah, you mentioned before the music, you know, I've... <laughs> I've gotten, I, I've kind of rediscovered my love for the uh, classic 60s, early 70s music over the last five years or so, researching this, uh, you know, this Laurel Canyon thing, and, and I find myself more and more listening when I'm, when I'm listening to the radio, tuning into, like, classic rock and deep, deep track type stations on Sirius Radio and stuff, and at first it was like a breath of fresh air, you know, I'm like, wow, this is great, it's such a... Great change from the stations I normally listen to that have a playlist of like 12 songs that they repeat endlessly all day long. But after listening to it for a few weeks, I realized it's, it's just as bad, you know? And there's only so many times you can hear Magic Carpet Ride, you know? It's like they play that song like hourly, it seems like. <laughs> Uh, you know, and uh, I'm like, come on, there's a lot of music, for this. but it's the same thing, you know, they got sure. this very limited playlist, and they just, they just hammer you over the head, uh, day after day, with the same damn songs, over and over and over again. I'm glad you mentioned that song, because you also notice, aside from this uh, neo-feudalist new dark age that they're always selling, the archaic revival, they're always also selling magic in the media, either, you know, via the music, you know, do you believe in magic, et cetera. And then uh, this magic carpet ride, you know, so what they want to do is get everybody away from critical thinking and into magical thinking, into Huxley's, you know, uh, brave new world worth of thinking. And this stuff goes all the way back to the Mahabharata as well and how the ancient Hindus, you know, the Hindu castes, uh, the the Brahmin caste uh, did mind control on the rest of society. That's basically what we're looking at here. But, um, you know, it's just the, the same thing. It goes from, you know, music to film to whatever. Harry Harry Potter selling that same magic theme, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, you know, and um, yeah, that, it was a big, you know, it was definitely a big part of the. Uh, it was definitely a big part of the Laurel Canyon scene. I mean, you know, a lot of a lot of these people were were like reading uh, Blavatsky, and they were reading Crowley, and sure. uh, you know, they were following all of that stuff, and. And it's reflected in, you know, some of the song titles and some of the band names and whatnot. Uh, especially, well, the early band names especially. Like the, the Mamas and the Papas, John Phillips initially called them the Magic Circle, spelled with both words, the, the occult spellings, M-I-G-I-C-K and like C-Y-R-C-L-E or something like that, the Magic Circle, which was, you know, a direct occult reference. Sure. Well, you know, the, and, the, um, the interesting the interesting thing about the word, ma or, you know, the whole magic idea, if you look at the word abracadabra, abracadabra is actually A-B-C-D. It's also based from the word abecedarian, one who studies their ABCs. And so when you think that magic is based on spelling and casting spells, it's all about using words and sophist trickery to manipulate people, and that's really what Magi is. And so, therefore, we have the Magi straight who, you know, writes laws, etc. And this goes back to uh, ancient uh, Egyptian 
worship and how they did their rituals and control. So this, you know, this whole magic theme, magic and uh, mysticism, you know, uh, the word mystic, to mystify, comes from to befuddle or to confuse. So the, you know, the mystics and the, the magicians, etc., they've always been the sophists, the sleight of handers, and and the tricksters uh, tricksters throughout uh, history and then what they've done is they've sold their own sophism to make it a you know a spiritual thing and then people go around following logical fallacies and uh, the secrets rather than uh, uh, doing something with their lives yeah absolutely i uh yeah i uh, you know <laughs> I, I was my 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 brain was was drifting there for a minute because I was just remembering that uh, I sent one of the people that I sent my book manuscript to for a for a review was my mother my aging mother who's eighty now <laughs> and uh, one of, one of the corrections she sent back to me was that I had in one place I had spelled the word magic with a uh, K M H with the K on the end. Uh, indicating that it referred to like a cult magic rather than you know like uh, stage magic, and uh, that was one of the things that she sent back as a correction, telling me that I had misspelled the word magic. So, old mom is uh, a little out of touch with those kind of things, but uh, unfortunately, it's a very uh, it's a very uh, pervasive part of the world that we live in, you know, and. Uh, you have to have some awareness and, and knowledge of that to really fully understand the world we live in and, and why things happen the way that they do, you know? Yeah, I sure agree with that. You know, well, David, I know you got to get going here in about 10, 15 minutes. So, um, you know, there are a whole lot more questions that we could uh, go into here. Maybe we should do another show sometime soon if you'd like. I'd love to have you back. Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, when I'm uh, hopefully uh, I am like... I got. I have like one more insane month to go. I probably today I was actually my first day I've had off in like a month, and probably the last one that I'll have before Christmas. But uh, once I get through this this ridiculously busy period and wrap up uh, a couple of jobs and get this book finally finally in its finalized form, which is a very nerve wracking process for me. You know, I've, I've, I haven't published a book since. Uh, uh, 2005, I think. Yeah, 2005 was the last month. It was left. So it's uh, it's been nine years. By the time this comes out in in uh, early next year, it will have been nine years since I since I went the publishing route, and I've just done everything just on, just on the web. And uh, the beauty of that is that I can go back and correct stuff anytime I want, you know, if I realize that I made a mistake here or there or that something's worded a little awkwardly or there's a typo here or there, I can go back and correct time I want, you know. But once you put something in, once you publish it as a book, it exists in that form forever and you just got to live with anything that, uh, you know, slipped by your radar so it's a very nerve-wracking experience for me because I'm I'm kind of a perfectionist and uh, I I can barely go back and read my old books now because I I just hone right in on mistakes that, that shouldn't have been there, and so I'm just like obsessed with this one with like uh, achieving the impossible state of perfection which sure. I will never achieve but I'm trying very hard and uh, it's very hard for me to give them final approval. And give them the green light and say, "Okay, that's as, that's as good as it gets. Go ahead and print it." You know, it's like, so it's like giving been, birth. Uh, it's like you know, writing a book is it like is. giving birth. So I've, I've been struggling with that for the last few months now. Just just uh, going over and over. I've reread this manuscript so many times. I just never want to read it again. And uh, I just can't wait to. Uh, thank you. Just can't wait to get it to bed and have my part all done and turn it over to them and let them do their thing and just have it out of my hair and, and hope that when the book comes out it will actually be in a near perfect form because there's no such thing as perfection but uh, you know and the reality is that I could go through I could go through this manuscript and proofread and edit it 50 times and on the 51st time I'd still find things that I think I could do better you know so 
I know. The, but at, I know at the some feeling. point, you just got to say, at some point, you just got to say, that's got to be good enough, and I got to let this go and turn it over to them and let them do their thing. And so hopefully by the end of the year, I will have the book out of my hair and a couple of jobs out of my hair and have a little more free time to uh, to do this again. So. Well, you know, there was one other person. I look forward I, to doing I, I wanted to, before I let you go here, uh, you know, there was one other person that I wanted to ask you about that I forgot about, and that's Governor Jerry Brown. What do you have to say about that guy? I've actually met him, but uh, I'll, I'll spare it for now. He is on the verge of becoming the longest-serving governor in California history for an unprecedented fourth term he's coming up for if he decides to run, which everyone assumes that he will because he has no competition right now, apparently. He's He's uh, wildly popular this time around. I don't know why. Maybe, I've, uh, I've met him. He's an he's an awful because, guy. He, he's an awful guy. I've maybe met because him. His, What's that? Maybe because his predecessor was Arnold Schwarzenegger. He looked good in comparison. But anyway, he was a part of the Laurel Canyon crowd. He actually lived in Laurel Canyon in the late '60s on a house on Wonderland Avenue, just. Uh, a walking distance from where the Wonderland murders went down at uh, 8763 Wonderland Avenue. He lived just uh, just literally a stone's throw from there down Wonderland Avenue and was uh, was very much a part of that scene. You know, was was linked to various members of the Eagles and the Jackson Brown, was romantically linked to uh, Linda Ronstadt, and, uh, you know, was a fully integrated member of the uh, the Laurel Canyon scene and a resident there not long before he emerged as our governor the, the first time around when he was known as, you know, Governor Moonbeam, supposedly the so liberal that he was, you know, I, I, I mean, they, the press just painted him as like the ultimate, uh, you know, far left liberal, which was pretty far removed from, from reality, but that's the way he was portrayed. But, um, the curious thing about that is that the guy who was elected to serve as his lieutenant governor, Mike Kerb, uh, also was a Laurel Canyon fixture. He was actually the guy, the, the, uh, the sound guy on the movie we were talking about earlier, Mondo Hollywood, and on a lot of other, uh, a lot of the other uh, movies that came out of that, that whole uh, nexus of... Now we know he's qualified to be lieutenant governor. <laughs> yeah, From sound so he, guy. To so he was, uh, and then, and then he became a producer. I think he actually opened his own label at one time, and uh, so he was a major. You know, he was a pretty major behind the scenes figure in Laurel Canyon as well, and he was very staunchly conservative, whereas Brown was, uh, you know, very far left liberal, and uh, they were elected together. As a tag team, both of these guys who just happened to have come out of Laurel Canyon just, just you know, not many years before with, uh, you know, Jerry Brown as, as the liberal and uh, and Mike Kerb as his underling uh, conservative. And Jerry Brown, of course, very soon decided that what he really wanted to do was run for president. So he was out of the state frequently during his uh, second term, I believe it was. Uh, on you know campaigning, trying to drum up, you know, start to start a presidential campaign, and so while he was out of state, uh, Mike Curb was the acting governor, and Curb put all of the you know in, in signed uh, all of this very reactionary legislation, you know, that was like way removed from. Uh, from what the people thought that they were getting when they elected this guy that was, you know, portrayed as practically a hippie, you know, Jerry Brown, Governor Moonbeam, you know, that that was what the people wanted, and I was scared of the times, you know, the, and uh, so they put this very very liberal governor in in Sacramento, thinking that the, that uh, he was going to govern accordingly, and instead he spent most of his time out of state and let Curb run this run this run uh, run things. Uh, with a completely different agenda. And uh, so now that they are kind of able to really subvert the will of, of the people, of what the people had had envisioned when they elected this guy, and yet Jerry Brown kept his hands clean because he wasn't the one that was actually doing it. He was out of state, and, uh, you know, it was Curb that was running amok. 
And um, so you have this very interesting tag team dynamic going on in Sacramento with these two guys who appear to be polar opposites and who both came from this very same Laurel Canyon scene. Um, so, you know, another, another interesting aspect of the, uh, and there are a lot of, of, of political figures bouncing around in Laurel Canyon that really shouldn't, you know, really should not have been there. Uh, I have reports of, of a, uh, a cowboy service, a male bordello operating in Laurel Canyon that according to some reports service the, uh, the elite of, uh, the political, military, law enforcement, corporate elite, including J. Edgar Hoover, is one of their one of their star clients. So, you know, according to these guys, J. Edgar Hoover was regularly tooling his way through Laurel Canyon to be serviced by uh, by this guy's uh, male ma- you know male uh, escorts. And um, we also had uh, this guy Albert Wolstetter, who was a uh, one of the one of the guiding lights of the Rand Corporation, one of the guys who helped get the Rand Corporation off off the ground, and and was one of the uh, sort of the directors for many years, along with his wife, who who also worked there, and uh, he lived in Laurel Canyon, and uh, his little social group at the time included a lot of the people who would later emerge as sort of this neocon cabal, uh, you know, Salome, sure. Kalut, Kal- Kal- Kalilzad and uh, I think Paul Wolfowitz and um, I don't know, a couple of these other guys were his followers and they would all, you know, I have accounts of that, of, of that these people would all routinely gather in Wolstetter's Wall Canyon home and sit around in a circle and, you know, do their thing, planning whatever it is, you know, world domination or whatever it is. So Between there you know, and the you have all these rock- you have all these countercultural icons, so to speak, in the form of rock stars and movie stars, and they're freely mingling with, you know, people like Jay Hoover and, and the neocon cabal and future Governor Jerry Brown and future Lieutenant Governor Mike Curb and, you know, all of these people who would soon emerge as these high-powered political figures who just happen to be bouncing around that very same scene you know, uh, this, you know, peace and love and flower scene, uh, they just don't quite seem to fit, you know? <laughs> so that's a whole other aspect. Wasn't uh, Jim Jones, uh, wasn't he associated with Brown in some way, too? I don't know. If he, he was definitely associated with the two guys that got locked up in San Francisco, Melk and uh, Moscone. Sure. You know, and I know, I know, uh, Dennis, I know Dennis Perone, who ran for governor, uh, you know, a decade and a half ago, uh, for the medical marijuana movement. And in fact, uh, in the opening line of the Harvey Milk film, they actually mentioned Dennis Perone's name. But, uh, you know, Dennis Perone actually knew, uh, Jim Jones too. But, you know, it's pretty clear to me that the whole, uh, Jonestown massacre was a, you know, a, a CIA operation to see how many people they could get to commit mass suicide at once. Yeah, I, yeah, either that or the cleanup effort. They, they had to uh, had to get rid of all any potential witnesses. I mean, it, it definitely wasn't. It, it was something far different from what uh, you know has been portrayed in the media all these years. Definitely, and uh, and there were other deaths connected to it as well. You know, like uh, Milk and Moscone. But of course, that's never that's never mentioned. As uh, you know, supposedly we're just supposed to believe that some. Uh, crazed uh, ex-cop or something just decided to go in there and gun him down because I don't know why, but <laughs> whatever reason. And then, and then, and then he evoked the uh, Twinkie defense. Remember that one? That was awesome, wasn't it? Remember the Twinkie defense? Uh, no, I didn't remember the Twinkie defense. You remember, yeah, the guy that shot Milk and Moscone, what was his name, Dan White, I think? He was like some deranged cop or something. Yeah, that was when they evoked the, the tweaking. Was he a cop or was he working in a? Was he a cop or was he working uh, in the government there with uh, Milk and the others? I don't remember. I think exactly. he was a former cop. I, I'm not sure, but I remember they invoked the Twinkie defense. It was uh, he had diminished capacity because he'd eaten too many sweets or some some kind of crazy ass thing like that. And I think he actually ended up getting off pretty easily. 
considering what he did, but I don't know, that's a whole other story entirely, I suppose. <laughs> what is the single most important concept that you would like people to understand from your work on Laurel Canyon? Um, I would say that the single most important thing to take away is that uh, we tend to give, we are a very celebrity-driven culture, I mean, obviously, uh, to like a ridiculous degree, and we confer upon our celebrities an incredible amount of influence, you know? I mean, they're like on par with... Uh, you know, with our political leaders, and you know, you you mentioned who was it? You mentioned Sting or whoever running around. Uh, Bono, you know, Bono tracing around Africa. Sure, yeah, with, Bono's uh, another good with one. The, with pres with the president of the World Bank, uh, but yeah, the the, the point is that we confer, we give, and a lot of that is manufactured, as you pointed out. You know, the manufacturing of icons of of, of false gods and whatnot, and and. Um, and and that is why that is exactly why these people are one of the reasons uh, that these people are so valuable as intelligence assets because they have an incredible amount of influence. You know, they have a lot of influence. Well, not only that, but if you're opinion. if you're in a band, you know, and and let's say you know in the '60s, the CIA and the government want to promote this whole drug theme all over the world. You got a band, you put them on tour. So now they're flying all over the world, uh, dispensing LSD in every major city, right? And uh, that's another thing that they have they have access that, that mere mortals like you and I don't have. You know, I mean, big stars like Lady Gaga, they're welcome with open arms anywhere in the world where they go. They're given access that we wouldn't have, and they have influence that we don't have. And and you know, for both of those reasons, they make very very good. Intelligence assets, and that goes back a long way. You know, we talked about Houdini. You know, John Wilkes Booth. There's evidence that, you know, compelling evidence that John Wilkes Booth was an intel, uh, an, an actor slash intelligence operative 150 years ago. You know, I mean, I, sure. I've come across evidence indicating that William Shakespeare was an intelligence operative as well as being an actor and playwright. And very and well could have been that, very well could have been female in, at that. So, yeah, you know, so this is a practice that goes back a very, very long time, and there are very good reasons for it, you know, as we've covered. These people have great influence, and they have access, and, you know, they, they are they are tailor-made to serve the agenda of the powers that be. So the main message I would say to you this book is stop, <laughs> stop looking to your celebrities for... Advice or stop looking your celebrities on you know stop or, looking up uh, to them anything really you know because you may think that your celebrities are are the are rebels and they're going to tell you stuff that the government's not or whatever and they're going to but uh, don't don't do not don't bank on that is all I'm saying because uh, these people for the most part are very much a part of the power structure, and they're selling the same agenda, basically. And uh, don't follow them. That would be my advice. If you, want, if you want to enjoy their art, you want to listen to their music, watch their movies, TV shows, whatever, hey, you know, more power to you. But do not allow these people to influence your viewpoints because they are not telling you the truth and they are not who they appear to be. That would be, I think, my main, I guess, message. Very Something good along point. those lines. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's your uh, website, Dave? My website is, my very primitive website is, uh, the name is Center for an Informed America. It's uh, www.davesweb.cnchost.com. I also now have a Facebook page up for my book, which is at www.facebook.com forward slash weird scenes inside the canyon, all written as one word with no punctuation or spaces or anything. And as far as I know, that is a, it's a publicly accessible page. You don't have to be a member of the Facebook community to access it. And that is where I have been posting, um, 
all of the sort of graphics that go along with the story, all the photos, my own photos and various other photos of all the all the different people and places so that you can kind of have the visuals. And where I'm also posting any updates as far as the publication date and cover price and whether I'm going to have uh, signed copies available and all of that kind of stuff. So uh, that is the place to go to uh, keep tabs on what's going on with the, the upcoming book. And my publisher tells me that it's very important that I shamelessly pander for likes for my Facebook page because they keep telling me that social media is a major uh, a major uh, advertising stream or some such thing these days, and that you have to exploit the. Uh, I hate social media. I got to tell you. Right so now. do I. I've, I've, I got to use it, but I publishers. My publisher is making me do it. Uh, they conned me into setting up this Facebook page. I don't know that I'm going to do anything. I don't have a Twitter account or any, any. I don't have any other social media resources, but I am uh, keeping this Facebook page up to date. And uh, and if anybody uh, likes it, then I guess go ahead and hit the little like button because uh, likes are some kind of measure or something. I don't know what, but. You're nothing in this world if you don't have likes on Facebook, I guess. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my, what my publisher tells me anyway. I, you know, right. whatever. That's funny. So, um, what is the title of the book going to be, the final title? It is Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon, Low Canyon, Covert Ops, and the Dark Heart of the Hippie Dream. And it's actually available right now for pre-order on Amazon. You can uh, pre-order it for shipment as soon as it's released. It has its own little Amazon page now. Release date? The release date that's listed on there is April 30th, but I don't think that's right. It's also listed on barnesandnoble.com for pre-order, and the release date there is March 4th. And a press release that my publisher sent to me a couple months ago that he said was going out to distributors has a date of, like, March 16th. So I, I have no idea. I've, I've seen at least three different release dates. So for sometime between point. March so, and April. Sometime in March or April it will come out, yes. <laughs> That's what I'm told. Well, they're actually they're, they're going to do a limited edition hardback before that. That is the trade paperback release. And they're doing a, they do some kind of a limited edition hardback where, uh, which I don't, I don't understand the, the, le the legalities of it, but they, they do like a hardbound thing that has no ISBN number. Sure, and um, then you sign each one, sign a number each one. So they could, pr they produce it themselves that way, and apparently it's much cheaper than doing it uh, the normal way. And they said that's really the only way that they can do it to produce hardcovers that are uh, cost effective, but that means that they can only sell them through their own website or, you know, maybe to me in a bulk purchase, which I can then resell. Uh, they won't, they can't sell them through any bookstores or online dealers or anything like that. Without, I mean, t technically speaking, the book doesn't actually exist because it doesn't have an ISBN number, but, uh, but they do actually exist, sure. and, and they're going to have a, a, a run of those. So that will actually be out earlier, and I have no idea what the release date of that is or how many copies will be available or what the cost will be or anything like that. So, again, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to post all that information that comes available on the, uh, on the uh, Facebook page. So Good to hear. Well, um... So that's the uh... – anyway, what time is it here? Ooh. Yes. Oh yeah, we got to let you get going here. But um Yeah, I got to Anyway, I want I want to get one of those first copies of that uh hardbound uh, autograph from you. <laughs> I have like I have something like 150 requests currently for signed copies of that and I have no idea if I'm even going to be able to get that many copies at this point. I, I initially it was supposed to be out in like late November, early December for the Christmas buying. Uh, and I, I've had people be wanting as many as six of them to give out to friends and family members. Like, ah, oh, put me down for six signed copies. I'm like, ah, kind of greedy, aren't you? 
You know, I, was, I, I have no idea if I'm even gonna, I have no idea if I'm even going to have that many copies. But I, yeah, I've gotten requests for well over a hundred, probably close to 150 copies at this point, and there which I'll go. be more than happy to sign and be more than happy to sign and send out if if I actually get them myself. But at this point, I really don't know. So I mean, I would definitely be able to make a bulk purchase of the paperback and sign and, sure. and sell those. But again, that won't be till like March or April. So yeah. there's still a lot that's up in the air. But, you know, as it becomes a little more clear to me, I will uh, I will keep uh, people updated on the, uh, on the Facebook page. So. Well, Dave, you know, one of these days I'd love to sit down with you and compare research notes, et cetera. You know, and uh, we had talked before about maybe one day uh, coming down there and getting you on camera, you know, when we talked last March or whatever. So, uh, you know, maybe we can still put something together on video one of these days. But, um, you know, thank you so much for, for uh, all your time today and coming on the show. Hey, no problem. Uh, glad to do it. Sorry it took so long to get it together. Hopefully next time uh, it won't, won't take quite so, so long. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm hoping that I get a lot of requests for interviews, you know, around like March, April, once the book uh, actually comes out. Because uh, I've been doing interviews for a long time on, uh, you know, various radio shows, and I never really have anything to promote, you know. I'm just there to just jabber, you know, so... Like a, almost like I had an actual motive for for uh, doing these shows, you know. Once the uh, actually have something to plug, which would be kind of a change of pace. So see how that goes, I guess, and uh, see. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm very curious to see how this is received, both by you know rank and file readers, you know, just you know gauged on like Amazon reviews and. Uh, and whether anyone in the mainstream will actually bother to, you know, if it'll if it'll get any actual, you know, uh, mainstream media reviews in any news, you know, is, is the New York Times going to review it? I don't think so. <laughs> but, uh, I'll be curious to see, and if they do review it, how thoroughly they trash it. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, eh, we shall see. It's going to be a... It'll be interesting because I, I I have not I have not ventured into the publishing in you know thing in in almost a decade. It's been it's been a long time. So this is uh, well, you know before I before be I for, before I forget you may I I know I sent it to you before. I don't know if you had a chance to read it, but my manufacturing the deadhead article. You may get some nuggets out of there regarding the dead and Edward Bernays and how these bastards tie into the whole thing. What was it? Um. Wasn't the dad's manager initially uh, Courtney De Courtney Love's dad? That sounds probably familiar, something like that. I wouldn't be surprised. And yeah, his there's name so many like Hank, times. Uh, his name's Hank something or another. Um, yeah, I can't remember his last name, but uh, yeah, I, I've heard that uh, the original manager was uh, Dave Geffen. Is was that like Courtney Love's dad? Dave Geffen is in here, and then he's tied to Cher, Ken Kesey, Yoko Ono, all of these dead people. You know, Crosby, Stills, Nash, yeah, this guy's English, Grateful this Dead, Guns N' Roses, English John Hank Lennon. And, yeah, uh, well. I'm not sure who her dad was, but she worked with Dave Geffen, and he's tied with all the dead people. Oh, Hank Harrison is here, and yes, he was tied to the yeah, Grateful Dead. Yeah, that's Courtney Love's dad. Yeah, and uh, yeah, he was involved with the dead. A, uh, repeatedly a CIA officer. Yeah, yeah, he was repeatedly a CIA officer. Uh, I heard that Courtney Love. Uh, can I, it can actually be seen in some old pictures with the band as a little uh, tall, you know, a little toe-headed little girl. Um, she can actually be seen in some of the uh, early uh, early dead photographs, from what I've heard. I don't know if that's true or not, but anyway, yeah, they're, they're, every, everything's connected. Everyone's connected. <laughs> yeah, know? for sure. It's. Uh, so anyway, um, very good talking to you, and uh, yeah, we should do it again after sometime after the uh, after the first of the year when my work is quieted down and the holidays are over and the book's in the can and I can uh, kind of get back to a normal pace of life. Hopefully, sounds good. I'll talk to you then. Have a good day. All right, man. All right, you too.